Hello, I'm Joy, poet of code by day on a mission to show compassion through computation and a graduate student by night earning my PhD at the MIT Media Lab uh, right now. And I'm really excited to have this opportunity today to share with you some of what I've discovered about algorithmic bias and also approaches we can take as an industry to mitigate this bias. And I'll start with a video that shows you my motivation for this work. As I make whimsical systems to paint walls with our smiles or project inspirations on faces, I enjoy using code to make my ideas a reality. Computer vision powers my creations, making it possible for machines to detect faces. But at times, I'm invisible. You see, machines view the world through a coded gaze. They digest pixels from a camera in dictated ways. Using machine learning, we create training sets with examples that help the machines detect new faces. A lack of diversity in these training sets leads to limited systems that can struggle with faces like mine. To save time, code libraries for facial recognition are shared like off-the-shelf parts. Many computer vision projects share the same code. Any bias in the system propagates widely and implants a coded gaze. The coded gaze reflects the views of whoever creates the systems. All of our work reflects both our aspirations and our limitations. Can we do better? Yes, we can begin by intentionally creating inclusive code. I call this encoding. Encoding is a mindset that asks, Who's missing? Detecting the invisible is easier when you have full spectrum teams equipped with different life filters. Who codes matters? Encoding is a process that explicitly checks the impact of bias during the design, development, and deployment of coded systems. How we code matters. Encoding is a personal mission and an invitation to create a world with a culture of inclusion a world where technology works for all of us and centers social change. No more masks. Thank you. Thank you. So as you can see in the video, machines aren't neutral. They reflect the priorities, the values, and also the biases of who creates the system. And this is what I call the coded gaze. And the coded gaze can manifest as algorithmic bias that can lead to exclusionary experiences, as well as discriminatory and also unethical practices. So let me show you what I mean by an exclusionary experience. And hopefully, we're good on the audio. in a white mask. So this is a different video where I'm talking to a camera and asking if it can detect my face. It can detect my friend's face. But when I come on board to see if it can detect my face, not so much until I put on a white mask, right? And in this instance, what we're seeing is an exclusionary experience. And so I had the question, why was I wearing a white mask in 2016 to have my face detected? And this led to an exploration of computer vision, which uses machine learning for pattern recognition. If we want to teach a computer how to detect a face, we provide many examples of a face in a training set. But if this training set is largely homogeneous, any face that deviates from what has been learned isn't going to be as readily detected. And that's in part what was happening in my case. But there's some good news here, because even though we can collect biased data sets, we can also collect more inclusive data sets. And this is important, because facial recognition technology is being used in other contexts, contexts like law enforcement. And so here we have in the US that one in two adults in the US, that's 117 million people, have their face in a facial recognition data set that can be searched unwarranted using algorithms that haven't been audited for accuracy. In 2012, FBI expert Brendan Clare 
did an audit to see how well some of the older systems worked on a diverse range of faces. They found the systems didn't work as well for black faces, for women's faces, and also for youthful faces as well. So when we're thinking about autonomous weapons, for example, accuracy matters, but there's also a larger question of the, whether or not this should be used. But beyond facial recognition, machine learning is being used in many other contexts. In her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, data scientist Kathy O'Neill talks about the rise of the new WMDs, widespread, mysterious, and disruptive algorithms. And these algorithms are making decisions around employment, whether somebody is hired or fired, insurance, if you have access to money, also if you have access to opportunities, and whether you and I pay the same amount for the same product on the same platform. And also increasingly it's being used in predictive policing, and as we'll discuss a little bit later when we're considering lethal autonomous weapons. So because of the need for ethical and inclusive artificial intelligence, that's why I started the Algorithmic Justice League. And the point of the Algorithmic Justice League is to combat the coded gaze. And we do this by one, highlighting bias. So people inside the tech industry, but also the wider public, is aware that machines are not neutral by default. We do this through talks, through some of the videos that you've seen here, as well as exhibitions. So that's a photo from the uh, Coded Gaze exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. As researchers, we're also building tools to identify bias in data sets and in various algorithms and classifiers. And finally, after we've highlighted bias, pointed it out, the main thing is to actually mitigate bias in some way. And so we're also working on inclusive practices for the design, development, deployment, and also testing of AI systems. And to guide this work, we're led by a set of inclusion imperatives. The first one is to dare to ask uncomfortable questions about the technology we're building and also who's developing this technology. At the Algorithmic Justice League, we've been asking uncomfortable questions about facial recognition technology. In particular, we've been asking questions about the benchmarks for success. In 2014, Facebook had an announcement. They'd released DeepFace, which had performed 20 percentage points better than the leading method for facial recognition, thanks to deep learning breakthroughs. And so here we see there's 97.35% accuracy on the gold standard benchmark. But I wanted to understand who is this breakthrough for? And if you actually look at the benchmark itself, you'll find a different story. This benchmark was over 77% male and 83% white. And so even though you have reportedly high breakthroughs, they're not necessarily breakthroughs for everybody. But that was a benchmark released in 2007. When we fast forward to 2015, the US government released a new set of benchmarks. And this benchmark was described as being the most geographically diverse benchmark to date. So there was some hope. When you look at the breakdown, it's a little bit better. We're 75% male and 80% lighter skin. And if you look at an intersectional breakdown, you really start to see some troubling figures. Here we're at 60% lighter males and only 4.4% darker females. And this matters because for Artificial intelligence data is destiny. If we have largely pell-mell data sets, we're gonna be destined to fail the rest of society and we need data that better reflects what our world looks like and we've been working on more inclusive data sets to this end. So daring to ask uncomfortable questions must continue to happen and also daring to ask intersectional questions. That way we can see if there's overrepresentation that might be masking problems or if we're overshadowing uh, certain groups. And we do this not just for data sets, but we also do it for different algorithms and commercial classifiers. The other thing is to dare to listen to the silence voices. It's one thing to test algorithms and data sets within a lab, but what happens when this technology gets out into the world? At the Algorithmic Justice League, we've been collecting what we call bias in the wild reports, and here's one report. A friend of mine works for a large tech company, maybe one represented here, 
and is having some issues being recognized by their teleconference system that uses facial recognition. While the company has some units that work on her dark skin, she has to make sure to reserve those rooms specifically. So this limits her ability to contribute to times when those rooms are available. And I present this as an example of what we call the exclusion overhead. It's not as if she's not able to perform her work, but she has to take a few extra steps to make that happen. And if we're thinking about having inclusive cultures and inclusive technology, we must make sure the exclusion overhead is low for everybody. The other thing is to dare to change and to invite public scrutiny. And so this means being more transparent about the data, the model, and also the use cases of artificial intelligence. And that doesn't necessarily mean opening up all of your data, but at least some simple descriptive statistics about how the data um, has been gathered, it, it been trained, and so forth. With the Algorithmic Justice League, we have a data destinies project that invites the public to see the actual training data that's being used for various machine learning algorithms. And we also invite them to help us tag this data so we have a better understanding of the representation of these training sets so we know specifically how to address the gaps. The other project we're working on is something called Game of Tones. Game of Tones is about product testing for society as opposed to individuals. So when a new product comes out, like the iPhone 10 with Face ID, we come in to say, OK, how inclusive is it across a range of different people? with different skin types and so forth. If you're interested in having any of your products tested as well, this will be an ongoing series. We play on the notion of tone, so we're also thinking about voice recognition as well. And our final imperative is to dare to dream, to dream of a more inclusive and ethical world where artificial intelligence works well for all of us and not just some of us. And I'll conclude with how one little girl's dreams became true. When I was nine, I sat in front of a portal that gave me a glimpse of a place where passions danced with possibilities. I was mesmerized by Kismet, the first social robot born of the MIT Media Lab. Kismet smelled at me as if by magic, and I knew then I wanted to uncover its mysteries. Eventually, I learned it was STEM, not magic, that made Kismet possible. The magicians were scientists and engineers. They used the language of mathematics to converse with the universe and create technology to enhance our humanity. STEM matters to me because it fuels my mission to show compassion through computation by using technology in service of others. As an undergraduate, I studied computer science and gained the magical knowledge. I developed skills to build the technology I imagined. Working with a nonprofit, I built an electronic data gathering system to help combat neglected tropical diseases. In Zambia, as a Fulbright Fellow, and in the UK as a Rhodes Scholar, I partnered with grassroots organizations to equip youth to create rights apps. I even started a hair care technology company with three other women. We use scientific analysis of hair strands to generate personalized product recommendations. From hair to rights, STEM empowers me to touch topics that impact my life. Most of all, STEM enables me to dream, to stargaze. Stargazing enables all of us to look beyond immediate barriers and see ourselves at heights previously unimagined. When I was nine, I wanted to go to the MIT Media Lab. This was not the assumed destination for a black girl growing up in Oxford, Mississippi. Now, here I am, striving to earn a PhD while leading the Algorithmic Justice League to fight bias in machine learning. I am her, daughter of art and science, fighter for justice, another hidden figure.